for those of you who may not know me, although I see so many faces that I, of course, recognize who are part of us, um, I am Colin Prescott. I am the chair of the Council of the Institute of Race Relations, which means that I'm a dog body, dog body. I, 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 I help. Um, and I'm privileged to have been asked to, to be the first person to speak at this gathering, uh, to welcome you all here, because just as I've been privileged to be part of the Institute of Race Relations um, for what feels like most of my life since the 1970s, uh, you know what's going to happen. You've received the sheet. Um, nonetheless, uh, I'll talk about that a little, in a, a little while again. Um, housekeeping. For those of you who haven't yet found them, the toilets, I think that's the main thing. Everything else, like getting out of the building, there are big signs telling you what to do, should we need to do that. Uh, toilets are at that door to the right. Um, the men's closer than the women's going that way. Toilets also that end of the, the, the corridor all the way down the bottom, and we wants to find them. I think that's the major housekeeping thing I want to mention. Um, and so on to why we're here. Uh, we're here, the head of the paper says, a celebration of the work of A.C. Van Anden and the Institute of Race Relations. Um, we're here to, therefore, to honor uh, our SIVA, but also to honor the huge people, the huge characters who gather around C. Van Anden uh, to support his leadership, to support the drive that he's had through this Institute of Race. So we're here to, to, to honor and celebrate all that, it seems to me, um, without any sense of hype. There are some of these people will be mentioned. If you look back through the pages, the, the issues of race and class, and race before that, if you look at the lists of the names of the people who've been on the Council of Institute of Race Relations, uh, you will see the reach of this place. When I first came to the Institute in the 1970s, it was, for me, it was filled by just three people. Uh, Hazel Waters, who's there, who was ace, ace, ace. Ace editor. I got into a fight once because somebody, well, I nearly got into a fight. Somebody came to the Institute and, and, uh, and kind of disrespected Hazel. Actually, the fight was both with Siva and with the other person. I did not realize how, and Siva was absolutely furious with this person. This almost the first day I walked in, wasn't it? Tony, Tony, <laughs> Tony introduced me to, to the Institute. Um, and Hazel was this wonderful person, ace, as I say, editor, really a pillar of the Institute of Race Relations. So honor first to you, Hazel. The other person in there was sitting on my right here was Jenny, Jenny Bourne. Um, Jenny is... <laughs> Jenny has... She's been our research coordinator she is now, it seems to me, the keeper of the records. If anybody wants to know anything, remember anything, who, what, where, it's Jenny. And those are the, those are the little everyday things that she did. But Jenny is also a terrific analyst. You look at her writings from the time that she took on the, the useless, bloody liberal sociologists back then to today. Just look. She is so sharp. And I know, I don't, I don't care. I've been told to not gush about things. But I can, it can't be helped. She has been so sharp and continues to be so sharp and continues to be something that we rely on in that place for guidance. Thank you very much, Jenny. And the third person in the place was Sivan Allen, <laughs> um, uh, uh, whom I got to know over lots and lots of time. Sivan Allen, fierce against injustice, but a really very caring, loving person. That's the thing that struck me about him. Is that why he perseveres has to do with the fact that he cares. He cares about injustice. And he cares about the people who come around, yes, to, be, to want to be part of that struggle against injustice. Um, OK, uh, so we're here to do that. We're here as well, therefore, to celebrate the IRR's achievement. Um, we don't do that with any sense of triumphalism, yeah, because everybody knows that the struggle continues to be extremely tough. Uh, the ground shifts all the time. Um, later on in the course of this, of this day, of this, this afternoon, there will be people who are talking about the things that we're focusing on now as a way of talking about where we are in the present. And we're here, most of all, it seems to me, I hope by the time we leave, we have that sense that we've not just reflected and remembered stuff in the past, but we, we're here to recommit, it seems to me. Everybody here, um, I think everyone knows why they're here. They're here because they, they want to be associated with this. I'm, Suresh Grover is here somewhere. He's been screaming at me for years, almost weekly, saying, 
the history of race relations with its history, its authority. It should be pulling people around to get, you know, to have full conversations about how we, what we do and how we can move more, more urgently and more together in this time. Suresh, uh, this is in part, this is in part, therefore, a response to your, to your pleadings. You're partly responsible for calling this together. But it is because we, we realize we, we've accumulated so much and it's a time to talk that we're, that we're calling this meeting. Okay, so that's why we're here. Um, what's going to happen? Uh, I have, I, all I'm doing here is not making speeches but facilitating, particularly this first session. That's my role. Um, uh, I'm going to, I want to be light touch in this session, but I'll be firm if it's needed, if necessary. That is to say we're anticipating beyond a couple of statements here, in fact mainly Jenny's here at the front, uh, opening out to people to speak. I have the names of some people uh, who, who got their hands raised ahead of the event, so to speak, uh, so they'll be called, maybe called first by me, but then the point is that for those of you who come here to say something, to do some testifying, as they used to say in the Baptist churches when I was a little boy, um, you will have your turn to do so. I ask you all that are hold yourselves in uh, to be succinct, to be as brief as you can be, because there'll be others who will need some space to say, to say what they have to say. So understand that. Um, finally, I guess um, I'd like you to be aware of the fact uh, I hope no one's going to start being self-conscious about it, that the proceedings of this event are being recorded for us by SAGE, our publishers. Uh, so just be aware of that sound. There's a camera around, uh, and that's what it's for. It's for, it's for us, it's for our record, it's for our archive, and so on. Okay? Right. Um, the first person who's going to speak about where we've been, to open us on where we've been before everybody else gets to say how they feel about where we've been, is Jenny Bourne, um, who's going to talk to us a bit, as much as he can, reflect on where we've come from. Uh, I joined only in the 70s. She was there before me. Jenny. So I'm allowed to take you down memory lane, just for a few minutes, I hope. And I want you to imagine that it's the 18th of April, 1972. And the Vietnam War is still going on. The PAIGC is still being led by Amilcar Cabral. The mangrove trials just ended, and women's liberation has just begun. <laughs> it's a balmy evening as we make our way past the Rolls Royces and Bentleys parked in German Street into the basement room at St. James's Church, Piccadilly, next door to the IRR's main office for an extraordinary general meeting to decide the fate of IRR. That was a culmination of years of long struggle by the staff. And we're a very motley crew. There is, for example, the director's secretary, who has cycled madly from her stint as tawny, what do you call them, tawny owl, of the brownie pack at the palace, which was established for Princess Anne. And she cycled all the way to make the meeting. And she's got the name, of course, of, of the Edwardian era. She's called Mercy. <laughs> we walk the gauntlet of the Black Unity and Freedom Party members who are leafleting in our support about British imperialism and an end to telling blacks what to do. And inside the hall, a packed hall, there are all kinds of people who take to the floor the leading academic professor on race, the founder of JCWI, critics from inside the Race Relations Board, all in our defence. We even have our own lawyer on hand. He's a trainee at Bernberg's. I mean, nothing changes. Just in case, we needed a lawyer, just in case the management pulls a fast one. And then the rabble-rouser of rabble-rousers from Black Power, Roy Saw. <laughs> he'd promised Siva he'd keep quiet, but he didn't. <laughs> what about those plantations in Guyana, Mr. Kane? He kept yelling from the back. Michael Kane of Booker McConnell's was the IRR chairman. It was also Booker's that made the Booker Prize, which was returned by John Berger the following year. We, the staff and membership, we won the vote that night, hands down, 94 votes to eight. That was the level of confidence members had in our board. The lords and ladies, members of parliament, 
heads of multinationals and newspaper groups and ivory-towered academics who had for so long controlled what constituted race relations in Britain and how it should be researched and were so out of touch with grassroots opinion, they were given the boot. The IRR had for 16 years been the pivot of legislation and organisation on race and now it had redefined the national race landscape. The IRR then was a completely different animal from what it has become today and we are here to celebrate not only that it's lived to tell the tale but it has lived the tale by saying true to the values, precepts and politics that emerged in what we call the coup of 1972. It was not black people who should be examined but white society. It was not a matter of educating blacks and whites for integration but of fighting institutional racism. It was not race relations that was the field for study, but racism, and that involved examining state power, not individual attitude. There was nothing that could be impartial about policy-oriented research when every government was putting its imprimatur on racism. Our task then was not to speak to the powerful, but from the powerless. So our basement room on Pentonville Road was a meeting place for all kinds of groups fighting oppression. Say in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, overcast. It was where we discussed the need for an anti-fascist magazine from which Searchlight emerged. Where the All London Anti-Racist, Anti-Fascist Coordinating Committee convened. Where black groups came together to negotiate a peaceful outcome to the Spaghetti House siege. <laughs> and where, as Colin will also remember, a stunned community met to discuss how to organise after Walter Rodney's assassination in 1980. For we were also touching other struggles worldwide, from the Oakland Panthers to the activists of Azarpo and Women in Black. The IRR still provides such a home for a range of groups. But I think with the Charity Commissioners breathing down all our necks, I'll leave that to your imagination now. <laughs> it has been a collective effort, of course, not just by the staff, but by the many volunteers and movements we have been involved with along the way, against colonialism, fascism, for self-defence, for migrant workers' rights, retrieving black history, against police brutality, school exclusions on fortress Europe, anti-Muslim racism, the security state, globalisation, but the fact that it stayed true, relevant, broke new ground, became the organisation that put gas in the tanks of groups in their way to liberation, that's Siva's phrase, yeah. <laughs> owes not a little to the extraordinary insight and commitment of A. Sivanandan, the key mover of that takeover in 1972. We've no time today to tell that whole story but we have materials available like this that do tell that story. And we also have evidence in some of Siva's aphorisms, like thinking in order to do, or one death is a death too many, and other insights of Siva's that have held us at the cutting edge for so long. And we will hear him now <laughs> telling Avery Gordon Magic. how he sees what he terms lived theory. This is an excerpt for, from an interview that appeared in Race and Class, but this is Siva talking to Avery. Um, beginning with the guidelines that you developed for Let's start at the beginning with the guidelines that you developed for working after the takeover and how they were different from what had gone on before. The guidelines, quite simply, came out of the struggle. The institute had been set up as an independent think tank, as an objective research body, but his work was becoming increasingly partisan, carrying out policy-oriented research, which supported the racist acts of successive governments, particularly over immigration. This kind of research, we came to the conclusion, was defining the problem as one of racialism, not racism, i.e. personal prejudice, not structured injustice. Policy-oriented research inevitably panders to the concerns of government, not its subjects. 
it was not relations between the races they needed looking at, we thought, but power relations on the ground. And that meant research would speak to the needs of the subjects, of the subjected, I should say, to overcome oppression and injustice. That in turn means that the research had to translate the authentic experience of those subjects into action. That in turn necessitated not taking away their authority over their own experience through either high theory or ideological orthodoxy. For between the experience and the meaning falls the interpreter. There were other things we learned. We learned that there has to be an organic relationship between the experience and its meaning for it to lead to action. In other words, there has to be an organic relationship between theory and practice. A relationship that takes in the general, state, society, economy, etc. And the particular, the individual, the community, and so forth. Both at once, moving between the two levels. Seeing the general in the particular, and the particular in the general. The wood and the trees, and the trees in the wood. This is especially so, I think, in the fight against racism. Because, as I indicated before, it combines the existential and the political, oppression and exploitation, race and class. Well, one of the things here that our struggle, the IRR taught us to do, was to break with orthodoxies, to change the terms of debate, the political culture, if you like. For example, we challenged the academic race orthodoxy of push and pull factors as a reason for immigration from the colonies and showed that colonialism and immigration were part of the same continuum. That we were settlers, not immigrants. Citizens, not aliens. Hence the purpose of my aphorism. We are here because you are there. Was to capture the idea of the continuum in a sentence intelligible to all. That, I think, is what theory should be doing. Similarly, we contested the Marxist orthodoxy that the race struggle should be subsumed to the class struggle because once the class struggle was won, racism would disappear. That did not speak to the lived experience of the black working class. Racism has its own dynamic. Black and white unite is a goal to strive for, not the reality on the ground, and therefore required that white and black workers had to traverse their whole autonomous routes to the common rendezvous. You know, in the course of the last 40 years, we have fought, if my memory serves me right, the official and academic versions of ethnicism, which divided communities and replaced the fight against racism with a fight for culture. Racism awareness training was another, which personalized racism and made it a white disease, and we come better at that. Identity politics, who we are politics, which created hierarchies of oppression. Our take was that who we are is what we do. And Lord's Commons remedy of positive discrimination was another example. To counter racial disadvantage, he said, which was like breaking our legs and handing us crutches. Our take was to break our legs in the first place, i.e. outlaw racism. The idea then also that racism was an aspect of fascism, which we combated. Our take was that racism was fascism's breeding ground. They recruited on that basis. The idea promoted by black professionals was another, that anti-racism should primarily address the class ceiling. Our take was that there were two racisms, the racism that discriminates and the racism that kills. And our priority was with the racism that killed. We were not in the business of ameliorating the problems of the black middle class. Then on the international level, we saw racism and I think we, we saw racism and colonialism as symbiotic. The struggles for third world independence against colonialism's racial oppression and class exploitation made for common denominators of struggle in the mother country. And the joint struggles here of Asians, Africans, and African Caribbeans that occurred in the 60s and 70s defined us as a people and a class, and a people for a class, and made black not the color of our skins, but the color of our politics. 
So when we took over the academic journal, Race, subtitled the Journal for Race and Group Relations, we turned it to Race and Class, subtitled the Journal for Black and Third World Liberation. And the editorial working committee, not working committee, was chosen to reflect that political line with the help of scholar activists and radical thinkers. And the basic principles that guided and still guide us were that the function of knowledge was to liberate. That we should think in order to do, not think in order to think. That the writing should be simple and direct and free of jargon because, again, in an aphorism, the people we were writing for were the people we were fighting for. These aphorisms signposted the direction race and class would take and pass on to our contributors. So I want to ask you to talk a little bit about how this sensibility or these guidelines translate into the way the IRR worked. That's not an easy question. Uh, the boards we had around the journal, I think, the, the organizations were composed of hands-on people, not absentee landlords from multinationals like before. We had Barclays, Booker McConnell, Marks and Spencer, Rhodesian Selection Trust. There were people who had been, the people we had were involved in liberation struggles in Palestine, Africa, the Americas. People like Thomas Hodgkin, Basil Davidson, Malcolm Caldwell, Ken Jordan, Ekbal Ahmed, Jan Karu, Orland de Letelier, oh, and many more, many more. Edward Said. Later, those involved in black radical struggles such as Cedric Robinson, Manny Marable, Barbara Ransby our own Colin Prescott, and radical injures insurgent thinkers, as you yourself know, and creative writers or journalists, such as John Berger, yourself, Avery, Victoria Britton, Nancy Murray, Barbara Harlow, David Edgar, Neil Lazarus, oh, and many, many, many more. They were all, they were not traditional ivory tower academics, and they were keen in the early days to help us thrash out our perspectives, and later saw the value of working alongside the staff on new ideas. That sort of cross-fertilization helped us grow. Similarly, the Council of Management has ever since 1972 been composed of those connected to community struggles or working to further causes of social or racial justice. And even today, they not only work alongside the staff, but tacitly understand their line, if you like, on an issue comes from the staff because it is precisely they who are usually closest to the communities under attack. I suppose, in a sense, you might, I might see the IRR if I'm not too pompous, as an inverted pyramid. For the strength of the Institute, what allows us to take the occasional conceptual leap, and we love our conceptual leaps, like droughts in the stream, lies in the fact that every member of staff is committed and connected to real struggles and campaigns on the ground, deaths in custody, racial violence against the EDL, justice for detainees, stop and search, anti-terror laws, anti-Muslim racism, and so on and so on and so on. It is that connectedness, that is what I'm trying to bring out as clearly as I can, that connectedness, that groundedness, that allows us to gather a picture of what is happening across the country, to take in new facts and move, as I said before, from the specific to the general and the general to the particular, to make sense of them within the system as a whole. Most of my own thinking every year, I'll come out of the worker day discussions with my colleagues. The RR after 72 broke down its internal hierarchies and in a sense modified the divisions of labor. Well, we are tiny. Just imagine, between three to six staff at any one time, plus volunteers, plus a council, plus the editorial committee, of course. If anyone goes out to speak, they report back to, to everyone at the daily staff meetings around the lunch table. Those who eat together, fight together. The issues they f they found on the ground, the questions they were challenged by, by people working in the community, then becomes grist to the mill that takes our thinking further. It was not a theoretical attack. It was an attack on the practice that emanated from that theory, which got in the way of our struggles at that time. It led to a sort of nationalism at the grassroots level. Today, for another example, the problem might be someone coming back from a conference in Europe and asking, what do we do with these new theorists who are into cumulative extremism, who are equating extremism, who are allowing the wolf to sleep with the lamb, who see any extremism, including that of the left, as the problem and not fascism? 
20, 30 years ago, it was me running around to conferences in Europe and being troubled by the limitations of the world system theorists like Wallerstein, Samir Amin, people like that, who did not speak to the new realities of the technological revolution, especially in regard to the new imperialism. For example, what was happening in the new free trade zones, the colony within the colonies, so to speak, and the new resistances that these threw up. I used to work in Sri Lanka for a few months in the year then, and I came across the free trade zones and the workers in it first time. And the president of our country, Mr. Jawadana's take on it was, let the rubber barons come. Well, from that encounter, I went on to think about imperialism in the Silicon Age, new circuits of imperialism, the difference between globalism and globalization, and later the nature of the market state and the failure of the left to what I term catch history on the wing. I suppose I'm being too verbose for every, but I think what distinguishes our thinking at IRR is that ability to stand things on their head, like Marx did with Hegel the other way around. Challenge orthodoxies. Our thinking is flexible, I hope, because we're not tied to long-term research projects, but essentially addressing ourselves to problems on the ground. And within that is the recognition, and it's important to understand this, that racism never stands still, but changes its shape its contour, contours, its impact, its inscape, according to changes in the political and economic worlds. We are always keen to racism's new avatars, as it were. But we make it a point never to essentialize racism. We never view it outside of the larger context. And the fight for racial justice opens us out to all of the other fights for justice, for justice and leads to real, vivid, living solidarity. The anti-racist struggle as we know it is over. We've got to fight new racism. The struggle is not over. The anti-racist struggle might be, but that was the way we knew it. But we have got to fight new racism, such as pseudo racism and anti-Muslim racism, that globalization and the war on terror have thrown up. And we've got to fight the idea that there is a good capitalism, that the market state will give us a good society. We've allowed the Tories to dictate the political culture. And unless we, on the left, whatever is left of us, begin to fight the political culture of neoliberalism and change the terms of debate, we cannot get off the ground for a real struggle to come together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Avery, for all the hard work you did to get that clear uh, recording. Sivanandan, uh, is often breathless these days and all the rest of it. You did wonderfully well. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for that history. Um, so full. I could, uh, just taking it in. And thanks to Siva for um, his swift conceptual analysis. For me, it all feels too full and too fast. I'm sure that you're you have to unpack it too, but don't have it coming rushing like that. And please, I apologize for the smiles on my face, knowing smiles on my face as I was listening to Siva's voice, for those of you out there. The truth is that I, I'm, I'm so used to the way in which that voice works. I'm reminded of things that I was there when they were, when they were first kind of uh, hit upon, when they were first invented as he speaks. So hence my, um, my grinning. And I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, I have one, a bit, another bit of housekeeping that I forgot at the start. For people who are tweeting this event, I don't tweet. <laughs> we are using the hashtag, hashtag IRRCH. It should be on the screen, John told me, at some point. Um, uh, sorry that I didn't say that much earlier on. Um, it's there. Good. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, now, as I promised, uh, you can, of course, um, uh, raise points. I mean, maybe or I just Jenny will take them about any of the bits that Jenny mentioned before. You may want to add your own comments to some of the things that were provocatively tossed out in Siva's interview with, uh, with, uh, with Avery. Um, uh, but this is the point which I'm opening to the floor. Um, and in, it's a funny opening to the floor, because I tried to say at the start, I'm opening to the floor, but there's some people who raised their hands before we got into the room, so to speak. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and, and, so I'm, and they're, they're in a kind of queue. Um, I want to first ask John. John Pandit, uh, to say something. Um, first, please, as you speak, I remind you, as succinctly as you can, and please say who you are when you speak. The microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
let me speak. Uh, my name is John Pandit, and uh, I've known Institute of Race Relations for many years. I, I've been uh, probably most known for my work in Asian Dove Foundation, the band, and we were playing at the start um, the track Caroline, uh, which uh, Siva uh, um, wrote especially. Uh, and we put it to music, and um, it was very important at the time. This is going back now 15, 15 years. Um, but we have a, the band Asian Dove Foundation had a long relationship with Institute of Race Relations. In fact, one of the staff members uh, put on our first gig, and we organised the first gig, which I think was uh, a benefit we did. And that's we came up from there, and then we worked on uh, CD-ROM. Anyone remember CD-ROMs? <laughs> yeah, that's all. Uh, called Home Beats, looking at uh, anti-racist and, and uh, you know this is for resources for teacher and schools um, and for school children. So we've had a long relationship in, in the work. And as a young activist, when I first came to London 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, I was at North London Polytechnic, and uh, many of us young activists got radicalised. We all got very radicalised. In fact, we got radicalised by a hate preacher. Uh, back, even back in those days, um, not many, many of you won't remember Margaret Thatcher. But, uh, <laughs> this is the truth, and we got into very various activism, very anti-racist struggles, but many other things, the miners' strike, whopping, lots of other things, uh, particularly anti-racism. And what I've tried to do since that time is to involve, is to use this kind of independent thought that we've had from the Institute of Race Relations, reading race and class, to actually inform ourselves, to give us that knowledge that we can impart through whatever we do, through art or music or whatever we do. And still then, give us that knowledge today that we can use now in these changing times. Another phrase that Siva's used is, uh, um, he's fond of using is, um, uh, uh, all that's solid melts into air. And uh, that's very true. I mean, you can, that's, you can see that late party in Scotland, for example. And we are finding ourselves, the world shifting very much. And uh, we need this knowledge, we need this experience, and we need to gather it more today uh, for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John, for being tight. Um, a lot of us, a few of us, were around the Polytechnic of North London in those back in those days. Um, my, 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 my student, then Tony Bunyan, was the person who actually took me into the Institute first. Uh, uh, and he was there at that time too. Sorry, I lectured at the Poly North London at that, at that point. Okay, um, next on uh, in my list is Suresh Grover. I want to, I, I want to introduce you, but I, you have to introduce yourself, Suresh, please. Uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, my name is Suresh Grover. I'm the director of a group, anti racist group called the Monitoring Group, which Set up, was set up in Southall in the 1970s, uh, late 70s, as a result of a racist murder of uh, a young Asian called Kutib Singh Chakar and then the murder of Dave Beach by the Special Patrol Group, etc. Now, my contact with Siva didn't start very well. <laughs> um, in the early 70s, I was squatting in Swiss Cottage and I'd come to, in contact with a kind of a Marxist sex called the Asian Socialist Forum, and they viewed um, Silva as somebody who was a black nationalist, and I was given the task of going into a meeting and disrupting that talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, very young, fearless, I didn't care who no. was saying what, and I was given the um, um, a view that Silva lived in an ivory castle and didn't have any connection with the black community, etc., etc. And as I came through the meeting, I think it was in the Institute of Race Relations, and I think Seva knew what, what I'd been asked to do, and he eyed me, and um, <laughs> as he made his contribution, I started thinking this guy is actually making sense, and, um, and that he wasn't a reductionist in terms of class, and he wasn't a black nationalist, and he wasn't what I was asked, what I was told he was. And, um, but because I was supposed to be fearless, I still made my intervention. Good. Uh, uh, very <laughs> leaking. Um, and then, I think, 
the relationship started off like that, but Sivan never treated me with uh, any venom or distrust. I was very young, I was 18, 19, I'd been stabbed by skinheads in Lancashire and come into, into racist politics. And I just want to say a couple of things which I think are very important about the Institute and race relations. Over the last 45 years, I think the Institute is an extraordinary organization. Mm. And I've lost it that period, and our organization is still going on. But there is nothing comparable to the Institute. With all the slight differences I've had over the last 40 years, I think I have to acknowledge that. And they're not strategic differences, they're technical differences on many fronts. And it's extraordinary because, as John has said, although the ground is shifting now, for us in the 1970s, the ground was shifting rapidly. We were being attacked, you know, Paul was in the background, the National Front was at the scene, uh, and the Labour Party was rescinding on its objectives of protecting migrants, and it had passed all sorts of immigration rules. And we had developed the youth movements, which were stigmatized, we had created a national movement. And we were in a period of trying to link up with individuals who created a theoretical framework. And at that time, there was only the Race Today Collective and the Institute of Race Relations. And we gravitated towards the Institute because of Sivas' very concise, very sharp, theoretical analysis, which were original in our view, and honest. And, and, and at every moment of the last 40 years, I've been involved in significant campaigns from Blake Beach to Bradford 12, to <coughs> Stephen Lawrence, post 7-7. I've had the privilege of having personal discussions with Siva to work out what the train and how the train has been moving and create a response to that ideological fight against black communities, whether it's strictly against African Caribbean, Asian, or the new migrants orienting Muslim racism. Uh, it's odd speaking about Siva in this way because he's still alive. The mm. last meeting I went to was Gus John's meeting, and he's here about his 50 years of struggle. Mm. And I'm glad the old bugger, as he would describe himself, is still yes. alive because um, I desperately want to talk to him again. And I, I wish the Institute another 40 years of success. Uh, and I think it, you know, it'd be painful when he goes for both. People like me who love it and the Institute family that have cared for him. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Suresh. Uh, I call him the old man, not the old bugger. <laughs> okay. Hello, America. <laughs> um, Speaking with the okay. <laughs> <laughs> two, two people have left the meeting so far. They came in, they sat down, they left. They both have got, had going off to speak at conferences. <laughs> but they came here for the few minutes to be, to be part of the, of the body of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, next on my list, I have David Edgar. David, thank you. David, you have to say who you are. I shall. Uh, <laughs> and I'll say that you're a member of the council and the Grayson yeah, class. And, and, and who I am thereby hangs the tail. I, I gather that, that Siva was, had a profound and sincere hope that today would involve, this session in particular, would involve people getting up and abusing him. <laughs> and, and, and I believe that's already begun. <laughs> um, and I, I want to reverse up a little and, and, and refer to you know, the Protection Society of people who've been abused by SIBA. <laughs> similarly, actually, although less profoundly, I, I, I uh, became involved with the Institute uh, by making an, a, 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 a misjudgment. I, I was I'm a, I'm a playwright by trade. I um, had been working with, on, on a play about the National Front uh, with uh, Race Today, which then shared a building with the Institute of Race Relations. Uh, and I knew that the IRR had, had very comprehensive files on the far right. And I rang up to ask whether I might be able to come and look at those files. And uh, as I then didn't, and still don't live in uh, London, that the, the most convenient date was a Friday. And the Institute doesn't operate on Fridays. And Siva asked quite bombastiously, 
uh, what on earth I had done to deserve the Institute opening up on a Friday so I could come in as a non-member and consult its, 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 its files. Uh, as a consequence, I sent in the then princely sum of £25, this is blood money, and um, <laughs> as a result, unexpectedly, quickly, became a member of the Council of The same principal operator of the Labour Party and coming up with the of the round. Um, and in fact, I had by far the most useful conversations about defining my view of the National Front and, and, and the British fascism in the 70s uh, at the Institute, and then wrote a pamphlet, or a piece for Grace and Carlson, a, a, a pamphlet which was attempting to save the word fascism from <coughs> its, its then current condition of being flung about like confetti uh, in order to reserve it for describing what it actually was, because if you didn't have that word to describe what it actually was, then what it actually was would, uh, would, would, would in, it become increasingly rampant, as indeed it did during the 1970s. Um, I, I just wanted to say, hearing Jenny running through some of the struggles that the Institute was involved with during my various periods, I had a gap in my membership of the of, 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 of the board that, that, that came back. Um, uh, and, and, and being reminded, I think, if, if, you, if you open the book, to be reminded that the Silicon Age article was written in 1979. Yeah. You know, with, with that sure. kind of presence. Yeah. To be reminded that a, a political and socialist and left-wing critique of multiculturalism uh, was being made by the Institute in, 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 in the 1980s. And to be reminded, I have to say, as I was last year, when both writing for the Institute and, and talking at the conference about the work of Stuart Hall, uh, as to what I regarded as the, um, as, as, as the significant overlap between those, those two thinkers. Disagreement, certainly. Stuart was on, on the Institute board for a while, and, and I, that was during the Marxism Today period, um, a heresy in which I myself uh, can claim some, uh, 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 you know, some dalliance. Uh, but, um, uh, and so that, that didn't last. But actually, I think, particularly on what Marxism Today called New Times and what uh, Siva called the Silicon Age, there was a much a greater overlap than, than was generally thought. And I think that was one of the things that, in, in the commentary after Stuart's death last year, uh, uh, people were noticing. And, and for me personally, very oddly, uh, from my tradition and background, uh, and in a sense my profession too, though Siva is a great creative writer, and, and Where Memory Dies is a, is a wonderful book. Um, but, but, but I found that the, the two people who had the greatest political <coughs> influence on me, one was a Jamaican and the other was from Sri Lanka, uh, and it's, it was a privilege for me to be involved with talking about Stuart last year, and a privilege for me to be talking about Siva today, and long may he reign. <laughs> David, to bring down your wit a little, my little phrase for the fact that you can mention so easily Stuart Hall, Sivan and their and their places of origin, um, is in the hackneyed phrase, the Empire Strikes Back, because they both come out of that tradition, of course. I'm not I'm not making a slight point. And it is it is that sense of being in the global, of being in a world that's been shaped. Yes, there must be in that sense, there's, there's, it seems to me, given them the edge on a lot of people for whom that comes as not as first nature, but second nature to think in that kind of way. Um, thank you very much. Indeed, I promised and asked for no hype uh, uh, around this occasion, talking about the Institute's record and past and talking about Sivan Andan. Uh, you will realize that people are saying really flat things here um, about hugely important matters uh, without any sense of hype. You know? uh, the, the, the Institute really has been. It seems to me, every saying it, has had that place in our political culture. Um, there are three other people before I can really open to the floor. It's getting really tight. We're supposed to end this session at 2.30. Um, so I have you. Uh, Say who you are, please. Uh, I'm Viru. I used to um, intern at the Institute uh, about a couple of months ago for uh, six months. Um, I got to know Sivar quite randomly through a friend, um, and I was very fortunate. Um, I'd never heard of the Institute growing up. Um, of course, it wasn't taught in schools. 
Um, but coming across the works of, of Sivanandan was um, a complete revelation to me, uh, especially you know someone my age, born in the 80s. Uh, you know we are not taught, or we generally don't have any sort of awareness and knowledge of you know the struggles of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, his essay on uh, from resistance to rebellion, for example, was incredible. Reading it for the first time. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of just briefly say, uh, on a personal note, as, as a Tamil from, from Sri Lanka, um, in fact, I'm sure many of you have read his novel, which um, is absolutely incredible, uh, one of the best pieces of literature I've ever read. And it's very, it's, it's beautifully written and, and sums up the country so well uh, from that sort of colonial period until the 80s. Uh, and then Deep Sibar said that's his sort of lasting legacy in terms of the island at least, um, it's very easy to sort of forget that there are sort of two sivas in a sense, I suppose the siva that many of us would not have known growing up in Sri Lanka, and there's also the siva that we're all aware of, the, the institute and the, uh, and the race and class and so on. Um, I mean, if you just look at some, I was having a conversation with some friends uh, <coughs> recently and just juxtaposing uh, his age to other people. I, um, you look at, you know, Martin Luther King, born in 1929, Fidel Castro, 1926, uh, Franz Fanon, 25, and then you have Stephen Anden, 1923. Uh, I'm not saying it's just to sort of make him feel bad about his age. <laughs> uh, well, maybe, but it's, it's more to show people that there was a, he had a, a life before then, and, um, he achieved so much in such a short space of time in this country, and uh, he's done so well in terms of uh, promoting about, uh, talking about the struggle in Sri Lanka and for Tamils. Um, and I'd just like to say, you know, all of us in the diaspora, second, third generation, we're all very proud of him, and he's taught us so much, and uh, long may it continue. Thank you. Uh, moving quickly on, uh, Purnima. Please say who again. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Purnima, uh, and uh, I have had the privilege and blessing to be able to uh, come to address Sivanandan as Siva Mama. Mama means uncle in my language. And out of respect, I'd like to uh, address him as such to be as well. I first came across Siva Mama when I read his article from Marxism 2009, uh, and it was published on um, DBS Jairaj's website. And I read that article, which was at, uh, it was at the height of the Sri Lankan war, and it was an analysis of what was happening at the time. And it was so to the point and eloquently put uh, that I really wanted to know who this person was. So I went and started looking him up online and uh, I found that he was the director of the Institute of Race Relations. And I hadn't come across the Institute of Race Relations before that. So I started looking into the Institute a bit more and I was absolutely amazed. And I started to read uh, Siva Mama's writings and I, I found that in everything that he wrote, that in every word of his, in every sentence of his, there was a heartbeat, there was a pulse, and that is what was so unique about his writing. And I just had to know him because it was almost like I saw his soul and I just needed to know <laughs> this man. Uh, so I started to ask uh, a friend of mine who uh, works for the BBC World Service, I said, oh, please go and ask if you can interview him so that I can get a chance to meet him too. <laughs> Because I didn't think myself worthy enough to approach him and just say, I want to speak to you, uh, which never somehow uh, seemed to happen. But uh, then in 2012, I started working on the oral history project at Race on the Agenda. And uh, I thought, okay, this is the perfect opportunity. I have a good excuse now to ask to speak uh, with Siva Mama. So I, uh, I started to, I tried to find his email address online. I went on to the Institute of Race Relations website. I started to look for a number. I know it sounds very stalkerish. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Yes, it does. <laughs> Sivamama, who have met him before, uh, trying to get in touch with uh, Sivamama that way, but everyone was so protective of him, saying, oh, he doesn't meet anyone now because he's not uh, too well. So, uh, and rightly so, everyone who knew him was very protective and didn't uh, give his contact details to me. So I thought, okay, I will just drop an email to the Institute of Race Relations and ask if I can speak to him. And and that is when uh, Jenny Mami, Mami means auntie in my language, <laughs> got in touch with me. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I was invited to come uh, to his place and speak to him. And I was told that he's a very fierce person. And I was, uh, I, and I, uh, he was portrayed as this person who, with whom you kind of need to be careful on what you say. And I, and I thought after reading his work, Surely, I mean, there is so much warmth in it, even though it is fierce writing. It's filled with warmth and <coughs> understanding of people's struggles, that it can't be that bad. And I had the uh, good fortune of uh, meeting Siva Mama and Jenny Mami, and they were coming to their home, and I had the good fortune of addressing uh, Siva and Siva Mama, and to be told off by him on many occasions on uh, how my political Political analysis on many issues uh, were incorrect, and I welcomed them <laughs> with so much gratitude. <laughs> 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 but, but one of the things that was really striking about his, uh, when I uh, started to find out about him uh, after reading his article in 2009, was that he doesn't just, because amongst, uh, because I'm a Tamil and uh, Siva Mama is a Tamil, and amongst the uh, Tamil uh, community, uh, you often find uh, Tamil people extremely uh, politicized, talking about uh, the oppression of Tamil people uh, in Sri Lanka and uh, and talking about issues of Tamil refugees here and asylum seekers here. But what many people fail to do is find that connection between the struggles of Tamil people here and other black people in this country. And that is what I found is so amazing about Siva Mama because I hadn't come across any other Sri Lankan until that point who actually looked at the struggle of BME people as a whole, of black and minority ethnic people as a whole. And amongst relatives and amongst friends uh, who are Tamil, often you would find a, a sense of arrogance where, okay, I'm a Tamil, uh, Sri Lankan, but that, that I don't have that any connection with all the other refugees or asylum seekers in this country. I don't have uh, any connections with other black people in this country. And it's that strong connection that Mama feels to all uh, Tamil um, uh, or to all black and minority ethnic people in this country, to all refugees, to all asylum seekers, to everyone who is oppressed. Uh, that, is, that is what uh, I found to be absolutely incredible in Mama. Uh, and uh, if you listen to him speak, it's, uh, his words, uh, it drips with poetry, and every word he utters is poetry. And uh, he quotes T.S. Eliot and Keats with so much ease in all of his analysis, which is really incredible. And that is why I'd like to quote um, Keats, uh, where uh, I think there was a quote where he said, uh, uh, I'm certain of nothing but the beauty of the heart's affection and the truth of the imagination, and that really applies to uh, uh, applies when I speak about Siva Mama. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am racing to the end of this session. I have two other names here. I am, I've been reminded by Liz that there will be space in the other sec sessions, of course, for people who don't get a chance to speak now to speak uh, to make their contributions later. So nobody panic if it feels like the time is running out and we haven't spoken yet. You've just reminded me that, in fact, that uh, the notion of black that you just talked about, see, but I think in the early statement you talked about it, it's never occurred to me before until you said it now that indeed he was a part of that moment. Because I always just thought it spontaneously came up. Yeah, we, we had that. And Siva says, for about 15 years, it lasted, this thing. You know, black as a political color, not as a skin color. Kind of, uh, and of course, he was a, a part of making that definition come into existence, which is part of his practice. I'd never thought of it as directly as that. I mean, he, uh, we don't give him the, the, the aphorism 
quote of you know black is political color. But in fact, he was a part of that movement. There are other people in this room who were part of that movement too. Okay, two people. I want to speak to, to, to ask two people to speak now, both of whom have been came into the Institute of Race Relations as kind of volunteer connections and became workers in the in that place. The first is Danny Riley, and the second is Paul Grant. Danny. <coughs> Uh, hello, my name's Danny Riley, and I worked at the Institute of Race Relations in the, in the late 70s to the early 90s. And now I'm on the council of the Institute of Race Relations. I, I didn't pay any money to get on. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, uh, but before I came to the Institute of Race Relations, I got a, a job for briefly uh, as a civil servant. And they put me in the Department of Employment on a small little section dealing with the Race Relations Bill, which subsequently became the 1976 Race Relations Act. And part of my job was to open the post. And one day I opened the post, and there's Racing Class, Spring 1976, leading article, Race Class in the State, Black Experience written by ACNN. And I didn't do any work that day, I just read that article. It blew my mind. It quite literally blew my mind. I can remember it to this day. Um, because it's what people have described and what Seeger has described about making connections, giving you eyes to see, understanding things. That negative thing, challenging people who are putting out nonsense about pull and pull factors, push and pull factors. So I went down the institute. I must have, it was a work day, so I must have taken the day off work. I can't remember. But I went down there and I said, this, this deserves wider, widespread really needs to get out there. And they said, actually, what's happened is we've produced it as a pamphlet. Now, the Institute of Race Relations is well known for writing really well-written reports. And nowadays, it produces really well-produced reports. Back in those days, this was the report. Uh, this is uh, the first edition of the pamphlet, Racing Class Pamphlet Number 1. It's got two statements down the side. Um, and I took some copies of that and I made everybody I knew buy them and read them. And I, I got rid of them all. So I went back again. And this time we got a second edition out now, and it's much improved because it's got statements down the edge. And I sold some more. And that's how I got involved with it. And Sieber's writings has that effect. You will hear lots of people talk about that. His writings and his speeches. We're later in, on in the day going to hear those speeches and if those and, and see Siva speaking and giving an interview. And if those of you aren't that familiar with it, well, you've got a treat in store. And I'm going to stop there because I don't know how to finish what I'm saying. Thank you very <laughs> much, Danny. And now to Paul. There are many people who could stand up and talk like Danny, people who came into that place young, uh, um, uh, um, learning, with the courage of anti-fascism, putting their, their bodies against the fascists on the streets, all the rest of it, and who grew in that context to, to, to big, huge sizes. Danny, and I'm looking <laughs> right, and, and I'm looking, and, and, and to demonstrate that I'm not being simply physically personal, the, another person who comes straight to my mind is Lizzie, who's sitting here, who's now the director of the Institute of Race Relations, who's globally respected as a thinker activist, yes, works on the ground, works at huge high analytical levels. She came into the Institute as a, just a courageous anti-fascist, <laughs> and put, her, put herself to work and grew, and grew through us. Paul. Um, let me carry on from what Danny was saying. In 1984, 1985, I was involved with a group of uh, church folk in Birmingham who were looking to challenge kind of racism awareness that was spreading in the churches at the time. See this piece on rap was a tour. I didn't understand it all, let's be clear about that. <laughs> but the bits I understood were used. And then one day one of our friends said, he's coming to Birmingham, let's go. All right, let's go. So we went to the tour. And Seba was in good form. He was genial, gently mocking, um, until the kind of question and answer session. <coughs> And some kind of teachers kind of took a very liberal view and Seaver already gently slapped them. And then he said, this is the moment I fell in love with the man. I think it was, fuck off. <laughs> I've had enough of your bourgeois bullshit. <laughs> I've got six Tamil asylum seekers back at home now and I'm leaving now. <laughs> and I made you fall in love with it. <laughs> and the audience 
audience had that moment divided into two. <laughs> there were the people whose mouths dropped like, oh my God, how rude. <laughs> and the other half, which would go, yes! <laughs> um, I was in the second group. <laughs> and what that did for me was open up the idea that you didn't really have to speak nicely to people who were stupid. <laughs> um, and the following that, I'll confess, I guess with many others here, I have shamelessly stolen Siva's work. Shamelessly. Over the last 30 years. Um, and one of the good things was that Siva's work and Institute's work more generally kind of we used to develop black theology in the UK, and having stolen stuff from race and class, no one has ever passed what we've done in terms of black theology. <laughs> so if you were ahead of the game, we were like 20 years ahead of the game, because no one's caught us up yet. So I just want to say thanks to the Institute, thanks to see <coughs> Folks, thank you very much for how you conducted yourselves, the speakers keeping brief, timely, all the rest of it. Um, as I say, there'll be more time to speak later. I have to get off this platform, Jenny and I, and to allow it to move to, as it says on your paper, considerations of the present, what's happening now, uh, with Lizzie as director, um, with Franchi and other people doing the work that they're doing, to have a sense of the Institute's, of the Institute's work right now. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.